And then you have cyberpunk. What can I tell you about cyberpunk? Well, The Matrix might be a good example if you're talking about movies. Uh, if you're looking at something like uh, a story, Johnny Mnemonic is a good example. And yes, those happen to be movies with Keanu Reeves, but the cyber comes from the idea that a lot of these characters in these stories are cybernetically enhanced. They might have artificial arms and legs, like the $6 million man, or like Johnny Mnemonic, they might have a, the ability to carry microchips in their heads, so you can become a, uh, a courier where you can deliver data from one place to another. And then you have the punk comes from the idea that these people are rebelling against the central government, they're rebelling against the big corporation that's taken over the country, they're rebelling against whatever there is to rebel against. I remember the movie uh, The Wild One, where someone asks the main character, what are you rebelling against? And he says, what have you got? Oh, the day the earth stood still. I think it, that's a warning of a possible dystopia. <laughs> Wouldn't you think? Yeah, that's right, Erica. That's a good example, yeah. Yeah, now we're getting into anime. Anime and also cyberpunk. Okay, good. So, so what do we have? My favorite, steampunk. Okay, well, we can all talk about steampunk. Steampunk has become very popular lately, and it's the idea that what if science fiction level technology existed in the 1800s? So you have Queen Victoria in space. You have, you know, you, uh, there's one called the Amazing Screw-On Head where you have this android that works for Abraham Lincoln. He's a secret agent and he has a different head that he can screw on depending on the mission. You have 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, although Jules Verne would not call himself a steampunk, you know, but I think, you know, in retrospect, we could say, well, the Nautilus was high technology that was not available back then. But remember when, you know, when steam engines came about, there was the idea that there were limitless possibilities. There could be steam-powered robots. There could be steam-powered uh, rocket ships. And in a sense, you, do, you still have the punk values, the idea that the characters are rebelling against some central authority like a central government. And think about the Hunger Games. Uh, it's not steampunk, but it goes back to the dystopian future where there is a rebellion. There is hope. You know, if, if this group of rebels is able to hold out long enough, maybe they will be able to change the dystopia into a utopia. So it's kind of, it's very, it's kind of patriotic. It's like what George Washington felt about the, you know, the colonial America. If they were able to do the impossible and, uh, you know, throw out the British, then we could take this dystopia and make it into a utopia. Yeah, Atomo. Yes, uh, I think it, yeah, I think it is. It, it, any society that you would not want to live in would be a dystopia. Okay, so, so let's look more closely at Fahrenheit 451. And it follows a traditional three-act structure, but you, you'll see that novels are divided usually into chapters, but in, in this case, you only have three chapters. You, you know, they're not really chapters, they're parts. So, part one, you have this man who works for the government, Guy Montag, he burns books for a living, and he meets a young girl named Clarice, who is a teenager, and she's a, she's a free spirit. She's one of these punks that I've talked about, who is unwilling to give in to the government. And she is the exact opposite of Mildred. In fact, one of the questions I gave my students that I'm grading the final exams as, well, not right now, but I'll be grading them tomorrow. Uh, how is Mildred Montag's wife different than 
Clarice, and they're very different, although in Francois Truffaut chose to have the same actress play both roles, which was very confusing. But this girl asks Montag, do you, you know, she asks him a series of questions. She says, number one, do you ever read the books that you burn? And number two, she asks him, are you happy? And he's never really thought about that before. Is he really happy doing what he's doing? And the answer is no. So Montag comes away from a, uh, a session where he burns these books that are owned by this uh, elderly woman. And this woman does what a lot of the, uh, the monks did in Vietnam during the war. Uh, she set herself on fire as a protest. She was unwilling to give up her books. And so she, she decided to burn along with her books. And he comes away very shaken and very moved by that. But he has a book. He has the book of Ecclesiastes from the Bible. And he hides it. And he goes home and reads it. And if you remember Winston Smith from 1984, this is very similar to what he did. Uh, and then you have Beatty explains history. Well, well, who is Beatty? Beatty is the fire chief. He's the antagonist. He is the person who represents the government. And he tells Montag, you know, we didn't become this way because the government uh, created a rule. It was the people. The people realized that books you know, they all contradict themselves, that books are useless. And Beatty is very happy about this. This is a utopia to Beatty. And he says, so the government, you know, kind of followed what the people wanted. They, they were not interested in books anymore. Now, this, uh, this doesn't explain the Internet. You know, I don't think Bradbury predicted the Internet. He didn't really think about the Kindle or electronic books. But we have to assume if the Internet existed it, or if it exists in this world, then maybe they found a way to ban the Internet also. I mean, that's what they did in China during Tiananmen Square. You know, they knew that the dissidents were communicating with each other on the Internet. And China has uh, several times, the Chinese government has tried to block parts of the Internet. I know you can't turn off the internet, but they certainly tried to. I like it when they contradict themselves, yes, but but you know what Walt Whitman said? Walt Whitman said, I contradict myself. So be it, I contradict myself. I am large, I contain multitudes. Okay, so, so Beatty also says that part of how they got to that point of burning books was extreme Political correctness. Now, you might say political correctness is a good thing, and I think it is. We want to protect minority groups. We want to protect people from, from you know, uh, racism. We want to protect people from being defamed. But I'll show you uh, some close reading from Fahrenheit 451 that explains how there are new minority groups in this society, like the cat lovers and the dog lovers and the, and the left-handed people. You know, we don't want to offend anybody at all. And any book that offends anybody has to be destroyed. And you can see the beginnings of that now. There are some libraries around the world that have banned Huckleberry Finn because it, it uses the N-word. So it's too much of a good thing. It's too much political correctness creates a disaster. Uh, and then, okay, part two is the sieve and the sand. And I'm not going to get into the, uh, I'm not sure we have enough time, but the, the symbolic meaning of each of these titles. But the hearth and the salamander, if you think of a hearth, a hearth is part of a fireplace. It's actually, let's see, if I were to draw one, it would look something like this. You know, it, you have the, the vertical part of a fireplace, well, no. The horizontal part down at the bottom, that's the hearth. And that represents the home life. And in fact, Montag's home life is not very good. He lives with a woman who is like a sponge. She soaks up everything that the government tells her. And she's perfectly content to be distracted. She's perfectly content to stay home, play her video games, watch the big screen TVs. It's kind of like if you ever lived with a guy who uh, likes to play World of Warcraft, and he forgets to brush his teeth, he forgets to go to the bathroom, he forgets to eat, 
All he wants to do is play World of Warcraft. Well, for some reason, Bradbury predicted it as being the housewife who would do that, but it seems to be that more men than women are actually addicted to video games. But, but the home life that the neighbor has, Clarice, is a, is a life that represents freedom. She, she lives with her uncle and her father, and they like to talk about books. Now, they're breaking the law because they own books, but, but they are living the life that Montag wants to live. Oh, oh, thank you, Erica. Yeah, good to see you. So then we have the salamander. The salamander happens to be a metaphor for uh, a, a fire lizard. There, you know, Bradbury explains that there was a, a Roman emperor who used the uh, salamander as his uh, uh, as his symbol, and it was it was almost like a phoenix. And so, just like the number four five one, the number four five one is the temperature at which books start to burn. And Bradbury actually researched that with a with somebody from the fire department, and uh, the firemen are proud of that. They use that as as symbols. And then the sieve and the sand goes goes to a story in Montag's childhood where if you see it, it's actually like a uh, pasta strainer and a little kid gave him, you know, said, I'll give you money if you can fill up this bowl with uh, sand and you can't fill it up because it keeps coming out the other end. Well, this is the fear that Montag has that he's been dumbed down that even if he can read a book, he will never understand it because it goes in one ear and out the other. You know, everybody in this future has been trained to uh, have a very short attention span and not to be able to do critical thinking and not to be able to read a book. And so Montag meets a, a uh, retired college professor named Faber, and Faber ends up helping Montag to debate Beatty. They, you know, Montag thinks that he can change his boss's mind, and this is the boss from hell. You know, this is somebody that is really just kind of toying with Montag and knows that Montag is going to break the law, but he wants to see how far Montag will go. And then part three is called Burning Bright, which could be, you know, pessimistic or optimistic. You could look at it as if Montag has a bright future or that the books are continuing to burn. The, you know, the, the fires are not being put out. The government is still burning books. Montag confronts Beatty and the Hound, which is a robot that the firemen use to capture fugitives. And uh, we can think of the drones that we use. You know, the United States uses drones to kill people and to spy on people in the Middle East. But maybe those drones are being used in the United States also. Uh, there have been some stories about that. So the hound is a, is a robot that I'm sure the idea of a hound came to Bradbury because uh, bloodhounds were used to chase runaway slaves. And, of course, we have the Hound of the Baskervilles, and those both have uh, negative connotations, symbolically. And Montag finds the book, people, and I'm not going to tell you about that because I don't want to spoil the book for you. So we're just going to move move on. And how is everybody doing? Does, can everybody stay another 10 minutes or so? Okay, so we're going to wrap up in 10 or 15 minutes, and then we'll have open mic or question and answer. So then we have characters, and uh, thank you. Okay, so then before we get to that, I found this online. I found this poster that says, Books Cause Dangerous Thoughts. For your protection, give all books to your local firemen for safe disposal. Well, this could be a, you know, a poster that you would see in the future in Fahrenheit 451, but the funny part is the fireman is dressed up like he's a World War I soldier. So you probably won't see one that looks like that in the future. And let's see if I can... Ooh, I closed all my windows here in my control panel. I like this control panel, although it kind of takes away from my PowerPoint. Uh, and then at the bottom it says, a message from the Ministry of Homeland Security. So I'm sure that there was a thought there that... When the Department of Homeland Security started under the Bush administration, I think a lot of people felt like they were in a dystopia. And, of course, it started with good intentions. 
you know, look at the, uh, oh, there's the audience view. Wow, that's great. Oh, but you can't see me over in the corner. Okay. Anyway. Maybe that's a good thing. Okay, just kidding. Uh, so then we have, of course, the cover over here on the left-hand side. And there it goes, bouncing away. Now let's look at the characters in the book. We have Guy Montag, and his job is to burn books. He works for the government. He's fairly young. He's, um, I think he's 29 or 30. We have uh, Mildred Montag, who is his wife. There we go. Okay. We have, what's interesting is uh, Mildred uses something called the seashell. The seashell is a device that goes in the ear, and you can hear all the propaganda from the government, and you can hear the music that they want to play for you, and uh, nobody else can see it. So you could be kind of talking to, you know, uh, you could be bopping along to the music, and nobody knows what you're doing. They think you're crazy. But don't we have that kind of thing with Bluetooth now? Uh, eventually, the old college professor Faber invents a two-way seashell and this is a way for him to give advice to Montag while Montag is debating his boss Beatty and that's very much like Cyrano de Bergerac you know where the young man was in love with the beautiful woman Roxanne and Cyrano hides in the bushes and tells the young man what to say well I think this is a similar situation with Faber he's able to tell Montag what to say and Montag has this earpiece and in a way you know, Bradbury has, has predicted things like the, the Walkman or the Bluetooth or, you know, the big screen TV, the online role-playing game. Uh, it's amazing the things that he came up with in this story. Okay, so Mildred spends a lot of time at home. And then Clarice is the teenager who represents the freedom that Montag longs for. Eventually Montag ends up being very much like Clarice. He, he ends up really being a, a lover of freedom. And then we have Beatty, who is the antagonist. He's the boss that you love to hate. He believes books are useless and dangerous, and he often tells Montag, you know, don't waste your time with books. And, you know, I saw the play version of Fahrenheit 451 in Pasadena, and there is a different plot to that version. That it you have Beatty is actually suicidal and he tries to get the hound to attack him so he will be put out of his misery. And he used to be a book lover, but when his wife died, he tried to he tried to gain some solace from reading books. And he said it was as if all the books were blank. The books could not bring his wife back. So he had this uh, epiphany where he realized that books were useless and he, he wanted he wanted to destroy books. That was his, uh, his mission in life. And it's again because of loss. It's like the Darth Vader character. You know, he loses his mother. He's afraid of losing his wife. And that's what takes him over to the dark side. Okay, so, so then we have Faber, who is the college professor who helps Montag. Yeah, exactly. That's a good point, Carol. And you see how that education is such a valuable thing in this book. You know, it the books are almost like the lifeblood of the people. And if they as long as they are kept uneducated and they're dumbed down and they're distracted, then everything will be fine in the society. At least that's the way the government looks at it. And then finally, the mechanical hound is a robot designed by the government and programmed to capture and subdue fugitives or to kill fugitives, as the case may be. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about imagery and symbolism. And one of the images in the story is 
Of course, the Mechanical Hound. These are two artist renditions of the Mechanical Hound. Uh, if Bradbury were writing this story today, possibly it would be called the Electronic Hound, or it may just be called the Drone, because now we have drones. But I like the one on the left because it has the, uh, the red and blue police you know, flashing lights, and it has six legs, which is kind of interesting. So Mechanical Hound represents evil use of technology. I told you earlier about Bradbury, you know, he doesn't like typewriters. Well, he didn't. Uh, he, doesn't, he didn't like to drive cars. He didn't like to, to ride in planes. He was very suspicious of technology. And he saw how technology could be used for, you know, nefarious purposes. And I think we can see with this, you know, if we want to talk about the, the latest IRS scandal, how technology can be used to, you know, pry into the lives of everyday people whether you're part of the Tea Party or not. And, and, you know, ever since that movie came out, the conversation, I think there's been paranoia about what the government is doing to, you know, to find out more about our personal lives and what are they doing with that information. So the seashell represents a good use of technology. Faber and Montag are able to use technology, you know, to its good. So... I think Bradbury is saying technology is not inherently evil, but it can be used, you know, depending on the, the you know, the, whether or not the person using it is good or evil. And then the white clown, I like to call the white clown the Jay Leno of the future, because the white clown is somebody that Mildred likes to watch on the view screen every night. And it's basically a guy that, that comes onto the view screen and tells jokes. But you'll notice that the society has become so dumbed down in the future that he doesn't even have a name. He doesn't even have the name Jay Leno. He's just called the White Clown. And then you have water represents freedom. Montag uses a stream to find the book people, and you'll have to read the book to find out more about that. And the sieve and the sand represent an impossible situation. So in the middle of the book, it's called the sieve and the sand because Montag is really worried that he's going to be arrested. Uh, he's not sure what his future will be like. And I think that he, he feels like the sieve, that if he's trying to read this book of Ecclesiastes that he's stolen, but he can't concentrate long enough to read it, and it keeps going in one ear and out the other, and he's afraid that when the book is taken away from him, he won't be able to remember it. It will just be a fleeting memory to him. Okay, so uh, I want to do some close reading. And close reading is a way that in my classes and in a lot of English classes, a way for students to understand a little bit more about a piece of writing. So, so bear with me while I read through this. I think you'll appreciate Bradbury's writing style. The Mill and the Sorcerer's Apprentice, yeah. That would be good music to, to play right about now. Uh, the Hound of the Steampunk Vills, I like that. Okay, so so this is the, the bad Montag. This is the Montag that enjoys what he's doing. Let's see, can I put my face over here? No. You can't see my face. Okay. Well, that's a good... Let's just leave me over here in the corner. And... Uh, so it starts, the book starts with, it was a pleasure to burn. It was a special pleasure to see things eaten, to see things blackened and changed. With the brass nozzle in his fists, with this great python spitting its venomous kerosene upon the world, the blood pounded in his head, and his hands were the hands of some amazing conductor, playing all the symphonies of blazing and burning to bring down the tatters and charcoal ruins of history. With his symbolic helmet numbered 451 on his solid head, and his eyes all orange flame with the thought of what came next. He flicked the igniter, and the house jumped up in a gorging fire that burned the evening sky red and yellow and black. He strode in a swarm of fireflies. He wanted, above all, like the old joke, to shove a marshmallow on a stick in the furnace while the flapping pigeon-winged books died on the porch and lawn of the house. Okay. The next one, you, you jump in if you want to give... You know, your own opinion of this writing. 
This takes place after they have left the old, the old woman's house and they have burned her books and she has chosen to sacrifice herself. He was too late. Montag gasped. The woman on the porch reached out with contempt to them all and struck the kitchen match against the railing. People ran out of houses all down the street. They said nothing on their way back to the firehouse. Nobody looked at anyone else. Montag sat in the front seat with Beatty and Black. They did not even smoke their pipes. They sat there looking out the front of the great salamander as they turned a corner and went silently on. Master Ridley, said Montag at last. What? said Beatty. She said, Master Ridley, she said some crazy thing when we came in the door. Play the man, she said, Master Ridley. Something, something, something. We shall this day light such a candle by God's grace in England as I trust shall never be put out, said Beatty. Stoneman glanced over at the captain, as did Montag, startled. Beatty rubbed his chin. A man named Latimer said that to a man named Nicholas Ridley as they were being burned alive at Oxford for heresy on October 16, 1555. Montag and Stillman went back to looking at the street as it moved under the engine wheels. I'm full of bits and pieces, said Beatty. Most fire captains have to be. Sometimes I surprise myself. Watch it, Stillman. Stillman braked the truck. Damn, said Beatty. You've gone right by the corner where we turned for the firehouse. So the fire chief uses the fact that he has read books as a way to counteract any argument that books are, are useful. So he, he's a very... He's a very resourceful antagonist. And this is where uh, Beatty starts talking about how they got to this point. And this, is, this will be interesting uh, as it relates to our point about what is a dystopia and how the dystopias get there. Well, thank you, Monica. Basketball, a fine game. Billiards, pool, football, fine games, all of them. More sports for everyone. Group spirit, fun, and you don't have to think, eh? Organize and organize and super organize. Super, super sports. More cartoons and books. More pictures. The mind drinks less and less. Impatience. Highways full of crowds going somewhere, 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 nowhere. The gasoline refugee. Towns turn into motels. People in nomadic surges from place to place. Following the moon tides, living tonight in the room where you slept this noon and I the night before. Now think about our society. Do you think our society is becoming this way? Mildred went out of the room and slammed the door. The parlor aunts began to laugh at the parlor uncles. Now let's take up the minorities in our civilization, shall we? Bigger the population, the more minorities. Don't step on the toes of the dog lovers, the cat lovers, doctors, lawyers. Merchants, chiefs, Mormons, Baptists, Unitarians, second-generation Chinese, Swedes, Italians, Germans, Texans, Brooklynites, Irishmen, people from Oregon or Mexico. The people in this book, this play, this TV serial are not meant to represent any actual painters, cartographers, mechanics, anywhere. The bigger your market, Montag, the less you handle controversy. Remember that. All the minor, minor minorities with their navels to be kept clean. Authors full of evil thoughts. Lock up your typewriters. They did. Magazines became a nice blend of vanilla tapioca. Books, so the damn snobbish critics said, were dishwater. No wonder books stopped selling, the critics said. But the public, knowing what it wanted, spinning happily, let the comic book survive. To be continued. And the three-dimensional sex magazines, of course. There you have it, Montag. It didn't come from the government down. There was no dictum, no declaration, no censorship to start with. No. Technology, mass exploitation, and minority pressure carried the trick, thank God. Today, thanks to them, you can stay happy all the time. You are allowed to read comics, the good old confessions, or trade journals. Now, to Beatty, this is, this is great. This is a utopia. Yes, but what about the firemen then, asked Montag. Ah, Beatty leaned forward in the faint mist of smoke from his pipe. What more easily explained and natural with school turning out more runners, jumpers, racers, tinkerers, grabbers, snatchers, flyers, and swimmers instead of examiners, critics, knowers, and imaginative creators, the word intellectual, of course, became the swear word it deserved to be. You always dread the unfamiliar. Surely you remember the boy in your own school class who was exceptionally bright, did most of the reciting and answering while the others sat 
like so many leaden idols, hating him. And wasn't it this bright boy you selected for beatings and tortures after hours? Of course it was. We must all be alike. Not everyone born free and equal, as the Constitution says, but everyone made equal. Each man the image of every other, then all are happy. And by the way, there's a story called uh, Harrison Bergeron about a dystopia where if you have really good strength in your body, then you are made by the government to carry uh, weights. And if you have really good intelligence, you're made to uh, wear these headphones that play these really loud sounds 24 hours a day because everybody has to be equal. So there are these handicaps that, you know, you're not allowed to have any exceptionalism. Anyway, uh, each man the image of every other. Then all are happy for there are no mountains to make them cower to judge themselves against. So a book is a loaded gun in the house next door. Burn it. It says bum it, but it should be burn it. Take the shot from the weapon. Breach man's mind. Who knows who might be the target of the well-read man? Me? I won't stomach them for a minute. And so when houses were finally fireproofed completely all over the world, you were correct in your assumption the other night, there was no longer need of firemen for the old purposes. Okay, so that's a good, interesting uh, way of describing this dystopia. And then you have Montag trying to read a book. He's on the subway, but there's this toothpaste commercial that keeps playing. And so this uh, dystopia is not communist. You know, it's a dystopia where there are plenty of advertisements for products, but the advertisements are so loud that nobody can really concentrate on reading, even if they were able to smuggle a book. So it's, you know, it's very much like our society. Have you ever had somebody you live with you know, turn up the TV so loud that you can't do your homework, you can't read what you were reading. Uh, and notice that TV commercials always seem to be louder than the regular program. So I'll just read part of it. Uh, trumpets blared, denim's dentrophist. And if you look up the word dentrophist, it means toothpaste. Shut up, thought Montag, consider the lilies of the field. Denim's dentrophist. The subway fled past them, cream tile, jet black. Oops, sorry. Let's go to the next one. They toil not. Denims. Consider the lilies of the field. Shut up. Shut up. Dentrophus. He tore the book open and flicked the pages and felt of them as if he were blind. He picked at the shape of the individual letters, not blinking. Denims. Spelled D-E-N. They toil not. Neither do they. A fierce whisper of hot sand through empty sieve. Denims does it. Consider the lilies. The lilies. The lilies. Denims. Dental detergent. Shut up, shut up, shut up. It was a plea, a cry so terrible that Montag found himself on his feet, the shocked inhabitants of the loud car staring, moving back from this man with the insane gorge face, the gibbering dry mouth, the flapping book in his fist. The people who had been sitting a moment before, tapping their feet to the rhythm of denim, stentrophus, denim, dandy, dental detergent, denim, stentrophus, 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 one, two, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, three. The people whose mouths had been faintly twitching the words, dentrophus, dentrophus, dentrophus. The train radio vomited upon Montag. In retaliation, a great ton load of music made of tin, copper, silver, chromium, and brass. The people were pounded into submission. They did not run. There was no place to run. The great air train fell down its shaft in the earth. Well, notice the way that Bradbury writes. He, he's creating this dystopia. You know, basically, it's just a subway trip. But from Montag's point of view, it's, it's a real nightmare because he's trying to read this book. And most of the citizens are happy just to listen to the TV commercials. You know, the, the commercials follow you everywhere, even into the subway. And, uh, and I think they, they're very much like his wife. His wife is content simply to be a consumer. She's not really interested in critical thinking. She's not interested in being an independent person. So this part is from Burning Bright. I'll skip this part because this is in the third, uh, uh, the climactic part of the book, and I don't want to spoil it for you, and uh, we're running a little, uh, a little late. So, and, you know, there's some discussion questions that are online. Uh, this one I, I created myself. Which modern inventions, such as big screen TVs, the iPod, and online role-playing games, 
Does Ray Bradbury predict in Fahrenheit 451? Then there's, in the opening scene, why are the books compared to birds? Because they, they are called pigeon wing books. Montag says, you never wash it off completely, referring to the kerosene. What could this mean symbolically? Why do you think Bradbury would introduce Clarice before Montag's wife, Mildred? Well, I think Clarice has a lot more in common with Montag, and Clarice really does represent the freedom that Montag longs for. And I think that he, he feels like he cannot wash off the kerosene because he really feels guilty for the things that he has done. How is life in Montag's house different from that of Clarice's house? Uh, is there anything unusual about the way the two men go about helping Mildred? How is it unusual? Well, there's one scene where Mildred is um, somebody who often ODs on the pills that she takes, you know, like the Rolling Stones song, uh, Mother's Little Helper. And there are these paramedics that are basically agents of the government, and they they come in there to pump her stomach and give her a blood transfusion. But they do it as if they're plumbers. They don't treat her like a human being. They treat her like a machine. And it's because so many people in this dystopia are unhappy. The government, you know, it's not spelled out this way, but I believe it's the government that is pushing the pills. As long as you take enough pills, you'll be happy. You know, it's like the George Lucas movie, THX 1138. It's the same thing. That's also a dystopia. And uh, it's a very routine situation. You know, these guys go from house to house to house dealing with these drug overdoses, which is the price that they pay for drugging their own citizens. And so there are other discussion questions. Uh, I won't go into these, but, you know, this PowerPoint should be available to everyone. I will automatically, uh, well, I will email everyone after the, the webinar and you will have uh, the opportunity to click on a link to get these, uh, this PowerPoint presentation. Ray Bradbury completed the novel in 1953. How are the themes of the novel relevant to America in the 1950s? How do you think the events of the 1940s and 50s influenced Bradbury's story? And I would say one of them is World War II. I think Nazi Germany with the censorship and the book burning uh, and the tyranny was something that people you know, people remembered and they were afraid they didn't want the United States or any other country to be like the Nazis or to turn into that kind of a society. And then number two is compare and contrast Fahrenheit 451 with another story, novel, or film that depicts a dystopian future. Well, for young people, it could be the, you know, the Hunger Games. You know, the Hunger Games has a lot in common with Fahrenheit 451. How is Bradbury's novel similar to and different from the work you have chosen? And then finally, explain the significance of one or more of the titles that Bradbury chooses for the three parts of Fahrenheit 451, and the titles, The Hearth and the Salamander, The Sieve and the Sand, and Burning Bright. Each one of those has a symbolic meaning. Okay, now, so we're almost done. Thank you guys, by the way, and uh, I really appreciate the fact that you've stuck it out with me so long. We have... Carol, Van, Lisa, and Monica. Here's a dystopian poem. This comes from my collection, which is called Love and Other Diversions. I know it's hard to see, but this is about the society in America, the way it became after 9-11. And, yes, this is supposed to look like the Twin Towers. And I'm not going to try to read the second tower because that's the same text in reverse. Reports indicate. Reports indicate that not one but two planes have hit the World Trade Center in New York City this morning. We believe that this is not an accident but a deliberate attack. A third plane has reportedly hit the Pentagon and a fourth has crashed in a field in Pennsylvania. Our country is under attack as smoke billows from the towers, death, fear, and panic fill our hearts as we free fall from charred windows, some of us holding hands as we descend. Little do we know that this morning marks the beginning of a new war on terrorism and Patriot Acts 1 and 2 will be part of our legacy. What other legacies rise from the smoke of ground zero besides Saddam in handcuffs and grannies in airports wrestle to the ground for their fingernail files? 
who still cries for us or even remembers us in this age of five-second sound bites. We ask you to remember us, remember us, remember us, please. That's it. So here's my advertisement. Love and Other Diversions is my uh, poetry book. It also has some stories that I've written. And this is where I get the, uh, the unmitigated gall to call myself a dystopian poet. Because a lot of this, this poetry is very dark and it takes place in a dystopian society. Um, you can get it from Amazon.com or BarnesandNoble.com. And there's a website there at the bottom, Lulu.com slash spotlight slash prof lambert which will take uh take you directly to my uh, showcase or uh the the long one down there dan underscore lambert dot homestead dot com okay so so here's a review horror filmmaker and author adam barnick who's uh one of his short films actually made it into the uh fangoria's uh Fangoria is a horror magazine. They have a Fangoria collection of short, scary movies. He has this to say about Love and Other Diversions. Lambert successfully switches genres, themes, and structure with an enlightened ease that towers over most writers' tendencies to fixate one idea or theme. He feels unfocused, dispersed, or dishonest. He touches on love, of course, regret, respect, and reverence for the past, finding the beauty in all things. Sensing the darkness inside as well as beyond man. He even has time to throw in some much needed political incorrectness, clever rhymes that are polar opposites of the Hallmark standard, and some sly humor. I am definitely on the mailing list for volume two. Well, there is no volume two, not yet, but uh, the thing about political correctness, that was a big part of Bradbury's uh, you know, personality. So if I can uh, be considered politically incorrect, I don't, I don't really mind. Okay, so, so this is my Works Cited page. So I've used a um, paperback edition of Fahrenheit 451 uh, published by Random House. And the study guide questions for Fahrenheit 451 were published on the Internet by uh, Jay Moshi. And I apologize if, I, if I'm uh, pronouncing that name incorrectly. But uh, the new version of MLA format does not require me to use the actual website address but you can find it if you do a Google search. And so I want to thank you for, uh, for participating, and I really appreciate it. Now let me uh, open it up to questions. And I might as well put an advertisement for my book up there. This is, a, this is called a shameless plug. Okay, so let's, uh, does anyone want to be unmuted? Oh, they were Pelican books? Oh, interesting. Oh, yeah, just like old times, Monica, absolutely. Thank you, Carol. So thank you to everybody, really. Uh, you know, Carol, uh, I'll call you Jan. Carol, Jan, Lisa, and Monica, I appreciate you being here tonight. And, of course, we have to have a commercial, and there it is. So this was supposed to be one and a half hours, and it went over about ten minutes. Okay, does anyone have a microphone? That, uh, does anyone want to say hello? Hi. Am I, am I, am I saying hello? Yes, hello, Van. <laughs> well, what do you I think? think? My mic is off. Questions, comments? Anyway. Um, I thought it was good. You you covered an awful lot of ground in a short time. And, yes, uh, I like that. And and you, you spun off in other 
directions, not yeah, just yeah. towing the line, or, which is good because that give people a little extra uh, history and, and uh, interest. Well, thank so, you. I, I hope I, I don't know if anyone has a... And you are still the king of PowerPoint. <laughs> yeah. Does anyone else have a camera? I can't see anyone but myself. Well, that's all right. Carol has one, but I don't know if it's working. No, that's fine. I'm just curious. Okay. Oh, always in front. I will know that for next time. I can put my, uh, my face always in front. Okay. I'm going <laughs> to... Oh, thank you, Monica. I'm, I'm not sure right now, but we'll find out. Okay, I'm going to I'm going to mute everybody including myself. Oh, who is that? Blackbird. Hello. Sounds like she has a baby. Yeah, does that Monica is that your baby? Oh my god, you can see me? <laughs> no, I can just hear you. Yeah, that's Tyler. That's my twin. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> cool. Hi. Yeah, he got up. So he's hanging out. <laughs> oh, cool. Well, it's too bad we can't do that with CTU and have everybody talk. At, you know, teach him to read early. Yeah, yeah that's uh, Colorado Technical the University. The girl. Well, maybe we'll try that someday. Yeah, the girl. She likes. Yeah, the girl. She likes. Yeah. Yeah. Suggestion yeah. Box. Suggestion box. <laughs> okay. Well, let's see. All right. Well, now I, I recorded all of that, so I guess uh, you, <laughs> I'll show you guys how to access that at some point in the future. So I'm going to I'm going to mute everybody, and then I'm going to sign off. I don't mean to to be rude. <laughs>